First off, I just got to say that when I turned on the movie and I saw that I had the first scripted line of the movie, I was like, Laura, oh my goodness. <laughs> first off, thank you for keeping me in because the first question that I get asked is, are you going to end up on the cutting room floor? And that happens a lot of times. So thank you for allowing me to stay in your film. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I mean, you were so great. The cutting room thing is so real. We had We cut so many scenes in this movie. We cut so many great actors. My best friend was in the movie. Um, I mean, it was just devastating. And it really has nothing to do ever with performance. I mean, maybe sometimes. Not in this case, ever. It didn't have anything to do with performance. It was really just the editor's assembly was two and a half hours long. Um, so, so we had so much cutting to do. And we had so many scenes that were just like so great on their own, but didn't necessarily like have to be in the movie. Um, but we're so, I'm so glad that you're in there because you're great shooting back in November, October of 2022, you then had all of the pan, the, uh, the, the strike to then be thinking about all of these choices that you're making. How was this process different, uh, for that post-production process when the majority of the industry is shut down? So you're one of the few projects that are actually, you know, in post-production at that point. I know. I mean, it ended up being, I mean, if the DJ had, had struck, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to finish it. Um, but it ended up being that like, you know, all the writing was done. So what, you know, all the shooting, everything was done by the time SAG struck, was SAG strike, but I had to write like all the ADR, like everything way early, you know, before, before the W, before the WJ strike, I had to write all of that way early. Um, and so it just like getting all of that done. And then we had to get all the actors in for their ADR right before the SAG strike. So it was all very like insanely stressful. <laughs> um, we, we recorded ADR before we had finished, finished editing, which was, is very rare, you know? So then it was like, I was having the actors just, just give me some laughs and some sighs just in case, you know, that we like need to put that stuff in at the end of the day. So it ended up working out, but it was definitely very stressful. And the stress pays off this past weekend. I mean, obviously, there's been a gradual releasing of this film with people seeing it. But for the first time, it is out there streaming for anyone to see, whether they were in Utah, whether they were in New York, L.A., Florida. Now they're in North Dakota. They're able to see this movie no matter where you are. What's it like that day leading up to knowing that it's going to be released on Hulu? And in the first day that it's out there, how did that feel for you to finally have this project out there that's been with you for what, six years now? Oh my God. Yes. Six years. Um, wow. That's a lot of years. Um, it's crazy. It feels crazy. <laughs> um, it's exciting. You know, it's really wonderful. And people have been so kind, um, on Instagram and, you know, people have been really kind and it's so, it feels so meaningful. You know, you, you write something, um, and it's cathartic to write, you know, just, just selfishly yourself. It's like a journal, you know, a very detailed journal. But then when people reach out and say, you know, this, this touched them or reached them, or they had some catharsis or emotion or laughed or anything, even just like, I liked it, you know, like that's great. Um, it makes you feel so much less alone in the world. It's super healing. Have you seen it on streaming yet? I mean, I'm sure you've seen it several dozen times at this point in its in its finished uh, form. But did you stream it? And what was it like the first time just seeing it on your TV, being able to sit back and watch it? I have not streamed it. Um, <laughs> I saw it on the Hulu like homepage, and that was very exciting. And people have sent me screen grabs of like number one on Hulu, and that's been super exciting um, all weekend. And that that's been so lovely. But I um, I've I've seen this movie so many times. Like our editor was like, I've she's like I've never seen a director watch a movie as many times as you. But I think I just I I had to throughout the whole process watch it in its entirety in order to make cuts and changes and, and to keep improving it. I had to every weekend watch the entire thing. I wasn't able to just like work on a scene and you know for many months just kind of scene by scene. I had to constantly rewatch the entire film. Um, so I've seen it so many times, <laughs> and then Sundance and then screenings and yeah. So I haven't streamed it, um, but I hope other people do. And uh, yeah, it's it's been very exciting. Uh, you mentioned Sundance. I want to talk about that for a second, because my goodness, you're going into that as a first time filmmaker of this magnitude. Uh, what is that experience like for you no, going into Sundance as one of these featured films? And then when you're there, did it meet the expectations you had going into it? Or what was the experience like? Oh, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> 
I truly am like speechless about Sundance. I don't know. My expectation was um, it was big, you know, Sundance is big and it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's a brand that has a life of its own and you hear the words and, you know, as a, as a creative person working in Hollywood, Sundance is revered, but it's so much bigger even than my biggest imagination of what it was. They they've built something massive there and literally build things every year. They come in and literally like put up temporary buildings and then take them down afterward. Um, so it's, it's massive. Um, and it was so, I don't know. It was just more than I ever could have imagined in terms of like media and the attention surrounding the festival and the energy and the love of art, the love of film, the love of filmmakers, um, the, the excitement just around, I don't know, there's something almost like childlike about it, which I find creativity to be very childlike. And there's almost like an innocence around creativity and art that they somehow have had and, and been able to have for this many years. They still have a kind of I don't know, awe or like childlike wonder about art, but then also there's like Acura is there. And, you know, like also there's all these huge corporations buying out buildings. And so it's this, it's a very interesting meetup of art and commerce and somehow Sundance has kept its soul and its integrity artistically. And I don't know how they've done it. And when you have things that are happening on such a macro scale like that with these big industries that are, you know, wanting to come here and perhaps take one of the films back to their streaming service for, for some of the other films that are out there uh, on a, like more of a micro level. Was there anyone that you met specifically that stuck with you or any sort of talks that you had with another filmmaker that may have stuck with you as you made your way back out of Sundance? Oh my God, Titus. Um, he's directed Exhibiting Forgiveness. Um, he's an artist. He's a, he's a painter, but he directed this movie, Exhibiting Forgiveness. I, he was amazing. We, we did a panel together. We spent the director's brunch together. And I was just like, everything he says is like a brilliant, like quote that could forever be remembered. You know, like he's just a, a brilliant mind. Um, Jesse Eisenberg, who was a friend of mine going into this, his movie, uh, A Real Pain was so great. And he's so wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, there was, there was definitely, oh, and Thelma, I saw the movie Thelma. Um, so good. Um, and Fred, an actor in that movie, uh, is a friend of mine as well. So it was, it was a very fun, like opportunity to kind of see people and friends and, and celebrate other people as much as you're sort of self-obsessed during that time, you know, and you're like, my movie is the only movie in the world, you know? And then you're like, oh wait, no, not at all. <laughs> There's all these other amazing films and, um, amazing artists. And yeah, so it's, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm really in awe of it. I feel like people have been asking me about the experience. I don't have a word to express like one word that could even encompass it. I'm just, I just kind of stand in awe of what they've built. I, I think anytime that you are going into releasing a film like that, or even in any of the acting projects that you've done, there's always a part of when you're a performer, that there's a vulnerability and a bravery that has to come with it. With you in particular, with this story, it may not be a shot for shot exact what your childhood experience was, but there's a lot of your story in this film. What was that experience like for you to be opening up to the public on such a grand scale, something that's so personal for you and such a, a big forming moment of your childhood? Super vulnerable. I mean, I think I can separate myself a lot because I, I find Doris to be um sort of an idealized version of myself. You know, she's like a supermodel with like a heart of gold. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, that's not that vulnerable. I've created this like amazing version of myself. Um, but no, I mean, so in, in that, because it's, you know, Doris isn't me, Christine is not my mother. You know, my mother didn't do some of those you know, sort of unbearable things in the movie. My mother didn't do that. Um, and so <laughs> no judgment to the Christines of the world, but my mother is not Christine. Um, so because of that, I'm able to sort of separate, uh, it, it from being my, you know, most gut wrenching soul exposing story. I wrote a book called acne that is like just exactly my life, you know? So that felt very vulnerable to release because I'm not saying semi-autobiographical. I'm saying this is a memoir. Um, whereas with the movie, I can kind of separate the more personal stuff. But I think the vulnerability with the film just comes from, I've just given so much of myself to it, you know, for the past six years, it's been, you know, at least since 2020, it's been my sole kind of focus. And so, um, yeah, so that's just vulnerable to be like, Hey guys, look at my art project. You know, do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about, I mean, here we are 2024 in February, it's been released and you, you said you've been working on it for, you know, almost half a decade. Now this project has been in the making. Um, 
when you're going through each individual one of these steps here, I'd imagine you're learning different things along the process. Was there anything that you learned through the process of making this film that you weren't expecting to learn or something that was different than you had expected it to be? Um, oh, everything, you know, I mean, because I, I hadn't directed before. So that was just a giant learning curve. Um, learning, learning, learning. I feel like I feel like the past 10 years have been just like the because I, I, I created a show and I show ran and that was my first time show running. And then I wrote a book and it was my first book. And then I directed a movie and it was my first time directing. So this whole the past, I don't know, however many years, seven years have been just firsts on firsts on firsts on firsts. So everything is not what I thought it was. Everything is better, like beyond my wildest imagination. And then everything is also far more challenging than I ever could have dreamed. Um, so yeah, it's all, it's all just been new, new, new learning, learning, learning. Um, yeah. I'm really excited to do something for the second time. I'm like, then whatever I do next, it just has to be for the second time. I can't like go do and I can't like go to chef school or something right now. I, I can't take it. Yeah. <laughs> what was it that made you want to continue diving into these completely different parts of the industry? So it, it seems like it would be um, would make me anxious to be diving into something so new. But then you're going, you know what? I'm going to try this, too. I'm going to taste this. Almost like the buffet of entertainment. You just grabbed it all. <laughs> oh, I'm psychotic. I, I really don't know. I mean, it came out of just because because in my mind, I was doing a show called Florida Girls and I everyone involved in that show. We thought we'd be doing that show for many years. Um, so I was just like I was like comedy TV show running. I can wrap my mind around this. But I think when COVID happened, it was such a shakeup um, in terms of like what is TV? Is theater coming back? Because I, I did theater in LA. I did improv in LA um, for a decade. So there was such a shakeup in terms of what is entertainment going to be that led me to starting this book, led me to compiling essays that I had you know, been working on over the years into a book, and then led me to start um, features because this was like a different, you know. So it really was just, I think, honestly, like COVID might have been the catalyst for like I got to kind of get my hands in as many different things as possible because we don't know what the future is, you know? Well, I have to say, as a director, you probably saved my entire acting journey. Uh, I want to, <laughs> can if you don't mind, I'd like to share the story of what happened on set that day. So sure. when we were on set, uh, I was your final shot of the day, what's called your martini. Uh, and we got to the set and the whole crew was there. There's probably about 30, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 people there. Because there's a lot of people in these productions that aren't usually there in a newsroom. So what I had been used to for a decade was the cameras were operated by machinery in the back. The director was like, he would hold it by a, like a remote control. So here we are, I'm coming out to set. And we had added a couple of new lines for those that have seen the movie. Uh, when Doris is on the couch for, I think, the third time in the film, uh, you can hear a voice in the background talking about hurricanes. Uh, and that was some dialogue that we had added in earlier in that day. And I felt so confident going on to set. You had asked, do you mind if we roll on the uh, on the run through? And I was like, yes, roll on the run through. And we got to it. And I had gotten, I think, four or five lines in. And the fifth line, just I missed a word and the rest of it was just all gone. So I was just sitting there on set and I saw Laura and I was like, I don't want to let Laura down. And <laughs> I'm looking around and I see the rest of the crew and I'm thinking, OK, well, I do know some of the statistics that I'm supposed to say that are coming up. So I'm going to say one or two of those. Maybe the rest of the line will come back to me. And they didn't. So I was just saying words that weren't my lines. At one <laughs> point, the boom operator just slowly pulled back the mic and just slowly sat down. And I was like. Can I have a sip of water? <laughs> you, came up, <laughs> you came up to me and I may be paraphrasing, but in not so many words, you told me, hey, everyone else on this set, just fuck all of them for a minute. It's just me and you right here. Just talk to me and we're going to get through this. And we did. So, Laura, I have to thank you so much as a director for being able to help an actor that was having a tough moment on set. So thank you. What's it like for an act, um, a director in moments like that when you're, uh, you know, be able to help out an actor. Oh my God. Well, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for, for saying that and for sharing that you were so great. It was, I definitely, I mean, my, my background, I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, it was acting. Um, and so I think that 
I just, I have a lot of empathy for actors. I think that it's hard to have that much empathy if you've never done it because it looks kind of easeful, you know? You're like, oh, you get your makeup done and you get costume and you come to set and someone, you know, tells you where to stand in this kind of light and whatever, you know? So um, it, it seems easeful, but it's it's just not. It's just the opposite of easy, you know? It's everyone staring at you and expecting something from you and you have to memorize an ungodly amount of dialogue and then you have to say it in a way that feels natural and you have to react to everybody naturally and then everyone's watching you and then everyone's making faces at the monitor and it's a nightmare you know so I think that that if you know that you can sort of approach the whole process with a lot more empathy for the performers but if you don't know that it just looks like they're drinking lemonade and having the time of their lives while everyone <laughs> else is moving heavy machinery around you know um so yeah no I'm, I'm glad that it was helpful I'm so glad that that, that worked out yeah, it, it was such a big help. And it, and the next two roles that I had booked right after that were both Alex Lowe as news reporter. And uh, I was able to learn from that experience to ask the director, hey, if I'm VOing, is it cool if I just have the script here just uh, just in case? Because usually well, a news also, reporter would have. <laughs> also, you should have a teleprompter. That's something that we learned is we were like, oh, no, news reporters have teleprompters. And we're basically just giving you like I feel like within a monologue as an actor, there's like emotion and things that you can sort of tie into to memorize like a page of dialogue or two pages of dialogue. But with a news report, we're just asking you to memorize like two pages of facts, you know, just back to back facts. And so I think I think that you should ask for a teleprompter and that anyone filming a news report should have a teleprompter on set. We learned that we were like, oh, we need a teleprompter. This poor man, we just like made you memorize 60 pages and we're like, and action. Um, so we all learned, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad we had that uh, experience together. Uh, one of the things I talked about the the dialogue was the Super Bowl. How'd you watch the Super Bowl this year, Laura? Oh, it was great. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, my my husband and I are in a tiny little town right now, um, in the woods, kind of just just off off the grid. Um, so we just watched it here, and it was very low key. But Usher, oh my God, Usher! I I can't stop thinking about Usher. I can't stop thinking about how easy he made that look. I, it was unbelievable. I was like, this man is just barely breaking a sweat and dancing in ways that I'll never imagine being able to dance. Um, he was great. I loved it. Um, but football, I mean, I'm not a huge football fan, but I'm, you know, my husband is and and I'm entertained by the whole thing. I was rooting for the 49ers a little bit just because of the quarterback's kind of underdog story. I, I love that. I always root for the underdog. That's just my thing. Yeah. Yes. But whatever cool. works, you know. Going from the the last pick in the NFL draft to going to the Super Bowl was quite yeah, the story for him. I know, and my husband knows that about me, so he always tells me like those little like emo those emotional stories because he knows then I'll be like, oh, maybe I do want to watch. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> she had Laura Chin. You can see her movie Sun Coast on Hulu right now, streaming everywhere. Go and check it out, Laura. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. Thank you, thank you so much, Brendan. Yeah.